Well, good morning. Are you glad to be here? You glad to be alive today? The Lord has given us all yet another day. You know, as I begin every day, when I get up, get in my car, drive to Starbucks, get a cup of coffee, on my drive, Reverend Will, I always pray and say, Lord, thank you for the beginning of yet another day. Thank you for a good, restful, and peaceful night of sleep. And I also say, I have no idea what the day will behold. Don't know what's going to happen from the next minute, second. Don't know how the day is going to unfold. But Lord, I place my life in your hands. Do with it as you will. I have no idea what this day is going to behold. I've made some plans, but those plans are only going to occur if you say yes. But if you say no, that's all right too. Because I place my life in your hands. And so, um, so I pray that today, that as we enter into a time of worship, uh, that we do so in a reflective mode, realizing that, that our lives are truly in the hand of the master that he has us, that he's holding us, that he's caring for us, that he's loving us, that we can't take our next breath apart from the providence, the sustaining power of Almighty God. Well, with that, we welcome you to our service this morning. If you're watching us on YouTube, welcome to our Sunday morning worship service here at Harvest Community Church located in the beautiful city of Birmingham, Alabama, where our pastor is none other than Michael L. Jones. I affectionately call him the bishop, and some days I just call him my friend. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to direct your attention to Romans chapter 12. You know, Pastor Mike has been preaching a series called Have You Lost Your Gospel Mind? And so I think it's apropos to remind ourselves what Paul says about the importance of our minds in Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we'll transition into a time of worship. Paul writing, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, and that also includes sisters, in the view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function. I need to read verse 5 so I can close it out. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the body. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God, and your response is? Amen. 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 Let's praise the Lord with song and praise. Amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. You know, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, the heavenly hosts continually praise the Lord. And they fall before him and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And so uh, the Bible admonishes us to praise the Lord and to give him our best. Amen. So let's give him honor as he he is the Holy One. He is the only one who deserves all of our praise and all of our worship. Amen. Can we give him some praise this morning? 
God. He is holy. He is holy and he is worthy of our highest praise. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to praise him this morning with all of our hearts. He deserves total praise. Amen?
we say the words amen we're in essence saying so be it we're saying to God so be it that is our prayer Lord so be it that your will would be done that you will receive the total praise so be it Lord you are our strength you are our source of joy you are our everything and when we declare amen lord we're saying so be it let it be done now as we transition to just a brief moment of prayer i'd like for this to be a focused time of prayer and this focus time of prayer to be around a, a biblical concept called lament where we take a few moments to to lament and to to grieve in solidarity with those who are indeed grieving and of course last week pastor Mike prayed for uh, my family Darlene's family uh, but there are other people who are going through stuff I want to read one verse out of Jeremiah chapter 31 the Lord dropped this in my spirit while I was standing over there and he took me back to my conversation with Valerie at the door this morning and this is what Jeremiah 31 15 says this is what the Lord says a voice is heard in Ramah mourning and great weeping Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more and as I stood in the back and, and Valerie reminded me of all the the stuff that's going on the tragedies in, Virgi in Virginia the athletes who've lost their lives and the grieving that has taken place uh, you think about what's happened out in Idaho and people grieving over the loss of children and stuff that has happened locally here with people grieving over the loss of children. And so in a sense, Rachel is weeping and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. And so as we as we close our eyes and we just join in solidarity I just want to pray that God's grace will cover and be with those parents who are weeping and grieving right now and at the same time for us to be thankful for our own children that we cover them that we believe that this is an hour of major spiritual warfare where it seems as if uh, the enemy has set his targets on children to take them out so that they would be no more but we're gonna stand in the gap right now and declare that the enemy will not have his way that the enemy will not be able to continue to take the lives of, of young people and children Father God, in the name of Jesus, we stand in solidarity. We lament. We join with those who are weeping in Idaho at the loss of those precious young people's lives. Lord, we join our, our, our faith and we, we lament and we weep with those who are weeping over the young men who lost their lives in Virginia. We weep with those who locally, parents who are weeping over the loss of their children here in the greater city of Birmingham. And Lord, it does seem as if that the enemy seems to have a special assignment to try to eradicate and take out as many kids as he possibly can. But Lord, we stand in the gap and we say no. Not in our own strength, not in our own power, Lord, but in the power that comes from you. And Lord, we just say, rise up, oh Lord. Rise up in the name of Jesus, Lord. And, and be a force against the enemy who seems to again be trying to destroy so many kids. Lord, be with those families in Virginia. Be with them. Comfort them, Lord. Help them to make sense out of this senseless act that was committed. 
Lord, be with the parent of the young man who who felt like there was the needed, this was the course of action he needed to take and, and they have to live the rest of their lives grieving over this senseless act. Lord, be with those parents. Bring comfort to their hearts and to their minds, Lord, especially as we're entering into the holiday season, Lord, because every Thanksgiving from here out, every Christmas from, for the rest of their lives, it will be marked by this, oh God. They will have to deal with the trauma of knowing that they will be celebrating Thanksgiving apart from their child. Can't imagine, Lord, can't imagine what that must be like. And so, Lord, help us again to grieve, but also help us to, to love on our children, to help us to pray for them, and for them to have the good sense to receive the prayers, God, not to kick against the admonition of the parents or seeing that our that our parents are that we're being overbearing lord no it is that we are looking out for their best interests so thank you lord thank you for our children they are indeed a gift from god and so we bless you lord we bless you in this time thank you for your comfort your word says that we are to come unto you those of you who are weary and are heavy laden and Lord, we thank you that scripture says that you are the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our trials, tribulations, and tests. So comfort, Lord. Comfort, comfort ye your people. Comfort to the weary. Comfort to the hurting. Comfort to the crying. Comfort those who can't sleep, Lord. Comfort those who think they can't face tomorrow. Comfort them, oh God. Comfort them is our prayer. We ask all of this in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Hallelujah. Come on, can y'all just sing one more question that I know? Uh, it's a little out of the ordinary. I don't know. Yeah, total praise. Let's sing that again. Let's sing another chorus of total praise. I want to get out of the way, but let's sing that one more time. Let's sing just let's one more chorus. Declare it. Yeah.
giving time. You know, but as I was standing over there, you know, the Lord was talking to me again. Do you realize how powerful giving is? And I'm not just talking about when you give into an offering plate, but all of life centers around giving. When you, when you give someone a phone call that haven't heard from you in a long time, it is refreshing for the person that receives the giving of that call. When you give someone a text, when you give someone a word of appreciation, when you give someone a gift, when you give someone a smile, it is still giving. And giving is something that God has given to us the capacity to do. That we get to give. And giving is nothing more than an extension of life. It's a free flowing of life that flows through you to other people. That's what giving is, man. It's an opportunity for you to be a blessing, to shower down goodness on other people. When you give that wife that compliments that make her smile, that make her day, when you tell her, honey, I love you, or honey, you look good, honey, you smell good, all you're doing is just you giving. But you know it comes back to you, don't you? You know, you know that's, you, it's giving and receiving. And uh, y'all will catch that later. Yeah, catch that later. It's grown folk, grown folk, grown folk, grown folk, grown folk. But we are talking about giving, so let me go on. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, you see how I'm giving her some, it's so good to see you, Rebecca. I'm going to ask you about school when you know what I'm going to ask you after church over, don't you? All right, well, let's give, Lord. You know, it's quite simple. There are three ways in which you can give financially into this ministry. You can give via uh, going online. You can give at the end of the service um, in the back. And you can give by mailing your gift in to the church. Those are the three ways to give. I don't really have to talk a whole lot to you harvesters because you guys uh, remain faithful in your giving. Not to us but you remain faithful to the Lord, and for that we are grateful. Let us pray as we give this morning and prepare to receive our pastor and the word of God this morning. Father, we thank you and we give you praise for giving us the opportunity to be conduits of blessing. There are multiple ways in which you allow us to be conduits of life through this thing called giving. But right now, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to sow financially into the ongoing work here at Harvest Community Church. We thank you for the faithfulness of harvesters who give on a consistent and regular basis. And Lord, we just ask that you would just continue to bless them as they give. I pray that the, the gifts that are received in will continue to be used for the advancement and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And for this, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Reverend Ron. Why don't you give Reverend Ron a little appreciation for saying amen. And, uh, Reverend Ron is full this morning, isn't he? Yeah, Lord over there speaking to him and everything. I was going to let him preach. But... Um, he might go an hour and a half today. <laughs> Let the church say amen. Reverend Ron, as you were talking about giving, I was reminded of the story of the preacher. Now, you know, we preachers, when we officiate weddings, normally the couple gives the preacher a little token of appreciation, a little uh, gift. Oh, right. And so this older preacher knew that this young couple needed all that they could have and the husband, uh, soon-to-be husband, hands over the envelope to the preacher. And the preacher says, you know, uh, I don't know what's in this envelope. I'm getting ready to give it back to you as a wedding gift. But I will tell you this. If you would have given me more, you would have gotten more. <laughs> 
Amen. Amen. There's a whole lot in that. The praise team could say, if you give me a little bit more, you would have gotten a little bit more. And with preaching, it's the same rule. If you give me a little bit more, you might get a little bit more. Amen or oh me. Amen. Why don't you stand up real quickly and turn into your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. Philippians 4, 1 through 8. If you have your Bibles, wonderful. If you have your electronic devices, wonderful. If you have neither, you can look up on the screen. It should be there. Let the church say amen. amen. Verse 1, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Sincti to be of, of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Father God, we ask that you would speak to us in your word today. We ask, Father, that Jesus Christ would be lifted up high so that we could see him. And as we see him, we would believe on him. And as we believe on him, we would be saved. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Won't you say amen? Amen, amen and amen. You can be seated. A number of years ago, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee for a series of meetings. I uh, was there a couple of days, and I stayed at one of those hotels where you get the breakfast for free, Carmen. So I was downstairs eating breakfast, and there was another pastor who was in the meetings. I saw him in the meetings, and evidently he saw me. And he said, hey, I saw you in the meetings. What's your name? I told him my name. We exchanged names. And he said, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Birmingham. He says, you're from Birmingham. Do you know Frank Barker? And I said, yes, sir, I do know Dr. Barker. Uh, he's, he's, he's a friend. He said, let me tell you my favorite Dr. Barker story. So he proceeds to tell me that a number of years previous to that, he pastors in Florida, there was a very discouraged pastor who he had lunch with, and he was so moved by this pastor's discouragement and the possibility of him leaving the ministry that he tells him, I want to invest in your life and I want to, to pay your way to, to Birmingham to spend a week with Dr. Frank Barker. I'll make arrangements for you. You can stay with he and his family and he'll take you. You just shadow him all week. My only requirement is I want to have lunch with you when you get back so you can tell me all the things that you have learned. Well, he does that. He goes and he spends a week here in Birmingham with Dr. Frank Barker. He goes back to Florida. They have lunch. And my friend is very, very excited. He said, I was so excited to hear about all of the things that he learned. And I said, well, what did you learn? Did you get a chance to shadow him? He said, yes, I shadowed him all week long. He said, well, what did you learn? He says, absolutely nothing. He says, now, you did shadow Dr. Frank Barker. He says, yes, sir, I went wherever he went and, and followed him to all of his meetings and, and, and I was with him in the entire week. He said, you didn't learn anything? And the pastor said, no, I didn't learn anything. All he did was pray, read his Bible, meet with people, and share his faith. I didn't learn anything. All he did was pray, <laughs> read his Bible, and teach it, meet with people, and share his faith. He said... Pastor Mike, I just put my hand on my head and said, this boy ain't right. <laughs> you know what had happened, don't you? He had lost 
his gospel mind. He had lost his gospel mind. And men and women, it's very easy for us in ministry to get so discouraged that we lose our gospel mind. That we don't understand that, 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 that what God has called us to is to pray, to read and study and teach our Bibles, to meet with people and to share our faith. We are not to lose our gospel mind. And as we close this three-part series, I want to give you a recap. In part number one, we talked about Philippians chapter one. We talked about Paul being in a jail cell as he writes to the Philippian church that he helped establish. We talked about the emphasis being on, on sharing the Savior, the emphasis being on Jesus and Christ, Jesus the Christ and, and sharing the gospel and, 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 and preaching the gospel to those. And, and that verse, chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. That's having a gospel mind. And then we get to Philippians chapter 2. Where in Philippians chapter 2, he talks about if there's any consolation in Christ, if there's any fellowship in his love, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, consider others as more important than yourselves. Verse 5, have this attitude or this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. But what kind of mind was that? It was the mind of a servant. We get in chapter 2 the illustration of Timothy who had proven character and he was a servant to the Philippians. He gives us the illustration of a man named Epaphroditus who, who lo almost lost his life for the sake of the gospel and the Philippians. And then he gives the illustration of Jesus Christ who although he was equal with God did not regard it uh, uh, equality with God as something to be held on to. But he humbled himself and became uh, a bondservant, taking the form and likeness of a man. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That he was a servant. That Jesus Christ did not come into this world to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I mentioned in that first topic that we weren't going to talk about chapter 3. Because Deacon Fred Horton is teaching on chapter 3. But I have to mention at least the theme of chapter 3 so you can see uh, the progression in which Paul ministers to these Philippians. And I believe the progression in which God ministers to us. In chapter 1, it's all about sharing the Savior. In chapter 2, it's all about serving society. But in chapter 3, it's all about sacrificing self. And Paul gives the Philippians an idea of what the true gospel is. And if we miss the true gospel, we will miss having a gospel mind. Because if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, then you certainly don't have his mind. If you don't have Jesus at the center of your life, then certainly you are not going to have his attitude. Amen. Many of us live our lives based solely upon justification, that we are justified by Christ, and, and that is the true gospel. But sanctification is a part of the true gospel as well, that we not only receive Jesus Christ, but Christ is to live his life in and through our own. Amen. And you'll notice... In chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, what Paul says to the Philippians is, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness which comes from God by faith. Men and women, we have a righteousness that comes by our faith in Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. 
Many of us think our relationship with God is based on our good works. Many of us think that our relationship with God is based upon how perfectly we keep God's law. Many of us think that we got to do good to be right before him. When in actuality, God says none of us do good. There is no possible way that we can be right before him. God's word says that our good works are like filthy rags. That our righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not a righteousness derived of our own. But it is a righteousness through him. Now you'll remember in the Philippian church and in this letter, the word sin is never used, but the word is implied. That there is sin in the church. And that we saw that sin as we read verses 2 and 3 of Philippians chapter 4. We understand that these two women were having a difficulty in the church. That these women were fighting with one another. That these women were at odds with one another. And these women could not agree. Men and women, if I was to summarize what was going on in the Philippian church, I'd give the word drama. And I don't know if any of you all understand drama, but I understand drama. Years ago, I made a commitment uh, to God and to myself that I wanted to live drama free. Yeah. It has not happened, but that was the commitment that I made to myself and to the Lord that I wanted to live drama free. You know, uh, in my past, I can find drama. In my present, I can find drama. And in my future, I can find drama. If I have any sojourners, won't you say amen? amen. You know, we cannot live drama free. And I believe that what Paul is centering on here is the same drama that these women are having in the church. Many of you may have in your own life. It may not be the same, but it is drama nonetheless. And so the question is asked, well, if I'm saved by grace through faith and I'm saved not uh, deriving a righteousness of my own and I know that I'm saved yet I've got drama in my life, maybe I'm saved based on the justification, but maybe God is helping me to learn to look more like Jesus Christ through my sanctification and that is just as much the gospel. You think something's wrong in your Christian life because you got drama. You think something's wrong because you got trouble. You think that something's wrong because you're grieving. You think there's something wrong because there's a little bit more month at the end of your money. You think there's something's wrong because relationships are strained. No, what God is doing is sanctifying us and setting us apart and making us look more and more like Jesus Christ. Years ago, a man said, how do you carve a marble horse? Well, you take a big hunk of marble and knock off everything that doesn't look like a horse. That's how you carve it. Well, how do you take a Christian and make him look like Jesus? Well, you take that Christian and start knocking everything off that doesn't look like Jesus. Like Jesus. I believe that this, this passage has given us four things that we need to be involved in so that God can knock off some of those things that don't look like Jesus, so that he can renew in us a gospel mind, so he can take our lives and glorify himself with the lives that we live because it's bigger than us, it's bigger than our troubles, bigger than our problems, bigger than our drama, it's bigger than what's going on in our lives. Jesus Christ is redeeming the world and bringing the world back to himself. Let the church say amen. amen. I think these four things you already know, so I'm just going to be reminding you. The first is in verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Men and women, we can say that so many times that it loses its power. But think about in the context of your drama, in the context of your situation, that's when God wants you to rejoice. That's when he wants you to give him praise. Think for me, if you will, your favorite ball team is playing. 
and your favorite ball team has entered into the fourth quarter and you're down by a number of points, that is not the time where you sit on your hands. That is not the time where you close your mouth. That is not the time where you zone out. And that is not the time where you remain silent. Silent. You begin saying, let's go. Let's go, team. Let's go. Let's go, team. Let's go. And if something is coming against you, you holler, defense. 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 You open your mouth. And if your team scores, you say, that's what I'm talking about. And you know and you have the expectation that your team is going to win. I have the privilege of serving the Birmingham Southern College men's basketball program. We had the black tie event last week. We played on Friday night. And as you do when there's a tournament, you play the weakest team first and you set yourself up for the more talented team later. Coach was so angry at the end of Friday night, we had lost the game. He said, this probably has to be the low period and the low point of my 15 years coaching here. To lose to a team like that, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. And not only you all who played, but you on the board bench gave us no support. You weren't locked in. You weren't giving us the kind of support that we needed while your brothers were on the court. Well, on Sunday afternoon, they played a team. He said, arguably, Pastor Mike, this will be one of the best teams that we play. We'll have to play our best game, and we'll have to be locked in. They had watched film all day Saturday. They had run through their drills. They had done what they needed to do. Coach, just he, he's not real charismatic, but he gave a wonderful pregame message about being locked in every single person from the one at the end of the bench to the ones on the floor we were locked in there was a media timeout at about three minutes left in the game and coach says we got them right where we want them we're down by one now you all could do what you know that you can do and what you believe you can do now this is one of the best teams they'll play all year how about during that game everybody was locked in how about during that game, everybody was focused? How about during that game, everybody was vocal? And we ended up winning the game by 10. Rejoice in the Lord always. When you are down and when you have drama is not a time where you are not praising. It is not a time where you remain silent. And notice, you have influence when you rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, verse 5 says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Because when you rejoice in times of trouble, it influences others to do the same. It's not a time for you to be quiet. It's a time you open your mouth and give him praise and talk about who he is and talk about what he has done and talk about how he has established this thing. And that he is able to make low places high and high places low. That he is the God of heaven. That he is the Alpha and the Omega. That he is the beginning and the end. That he is the first and the last. That he is God and God alone. Amen, Amen or oh me. Amen. So we're to praise. But point number two is we're also to pray. Look at verses six and seven. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I know that's a familiar passage. I know that you quote it all the time. I know that you know it. But what I'd like to direct your attention to is be anxious for nothing. Prayer in the midst of drama. Prayer in the midst of trouble. Prayer that, that, that focuses your mind upon God. Prayer that focuses on his sufficiency and our dependence. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, prayer, just general prayer, supplication, uh, praying for others and praying for the issue, and thanksgiving. Thank you, God, that you're sufficient. Thank you, God, that you're able. Thank you, God, that you're a healer. Thank you, God, that you're a provider. Thank you, God, that you're a way maker. Thank you, God, that you're a keeper. Thank you, God, that you got this thing. 
Thank you, God, that I can put it in your hands. Thank you, God, that through your spirit, you'll give me love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there are no law. Father, I thank you that you got this. And then what will happen is that he will give you his peace. And that peace will guard you. It will guard your hearts and your what? It will guard your heart and your mind. How about prayer affects your mind? How about maybe we've lost our gospel mind because we've lost the habit of prayer? How about maybe we, be, be our prayerlessness is de- directly related to us not having the mind of Christ? So I'm convicted about my lack of prayer, Reverend Will. I don't pray enough. And it could be that I don't pray effectively. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I don't know about you, but I need to make a commitment to the Lord and to myself that I'm going to learn how to pray. Probably one of the most powerful things my pastor gave me, he would say it every meeting. He would say it if he was out preaching at a guest church. He would say, I asked the Lord to give me three things. And ask the Lord to give me the same. He said, Lord, I want you to give me wisdom that I might go in and out amongst your people. Lord, I want to, if it's your will, I only want to pastor one church. One church. And then he said, Lord, my third request, teach me how to pray. Men and women, that's, I I, I just, uh, that imprinted on me. And that last one about learning how to pray. We got to learn how to pray. Point number three, not only uh, praise uh, and prayer, but our perspective needs to be right. And we have to do some due diligence to make our minds right. Verse eight says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on these things, things that are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things, and men and women, that, that there is this battle going on that says, don't meditate on the things that are true. Don't meditate on the things that are noble. Don't meditate on the things that are just or lovely or praiseworthy. You, our, our minds are in a battlefield. And I'll never forget when the beloved deacon at our former church, Walter Hill, when he passed away, he lived alone over on Enon Ridge lived in a real small house. And the news report came out that a house burned up on Enid Ridge. And what we found is that that someone broke in to Deacon Hill's house and murdered him and robbed him and then burned his house down to cover up the evidence. Well, I wasn't on for the eulogy, but I was on for, for remarks. And I was bombarded by the sorrow and I was bombarded by what had happened and I was bombarded by the situation in in, in which uh, 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 surrounding Deacon Hill's departure. And as I got up at his funeral service to speak, the Lord impressed upon me through his spirit. And this is what I said. I said, all of us loved Deacon Hill. All of us loved him very much. And I have decided not to think about how he died, but to concentrate on how he lived. And each one of us has a decision to make today. You can take your bad situation and only focus on the bad situation. You can take your drama and that be all you focus on is the drama. 
But the word of God says here, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or of good report, anything virtuous, anything praiseworthy, if you could find anything in that situation that you could praise God for, he's saying praise me. That's what guards your heart and your mind. You'll notice in these three things that I mentioned, Paul never ever mentions the women or the situation again. He just gives a prescription to the Philippians on how to act. He gives a prescription to the Philippians on, on what to do, that you're to praise God, that you're to pray, that you're to get your perspective right, and then when you have the opportunity, you need to give. The final point is pennies. That's the only word that I could think of that started with the letter P, that fit. Uh, there's a laugh that goes right there. Uh, I need one of those big old laugh things that says laugh, you know, if you're in, in, in the studio. But Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. He's telling the Philippians, you shared with me, you gave to me. Epaphroditus is the man that brought the gift he says, now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me or no church gave me any financial support concerning giving and receiving, but you. You Philippians gave. You gave to me. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Men and women, when you find yourself in drama, or you find loved ones in drama, or you find trouble. It doesn't happen all the time. It's not the right situation all the time. But sometimes if you're aware of a need, giving is a huge blessing. Amen. Giving is a huge blessing. And men and women, I know what you're thinking about. You're thinking, uh, I don't have anything to give. Well, I believe, and I wish it was a scripture, Reverend Ron, it's not a scripture, and you, you, you'll tell me right away because you, you're the resident Bible teacher in the house. But I wish this was a scripture. You can't beat. Is that a verse? You can't beat. I know it's a song. You can't beat God given no matter what, how hard you try. I was going to the boys' basketball game. Our girls didn't play on Friday night, and I was driving to Tuscaloosa, well, the girls found out I was going to the game, and about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, one of the girls said, Pastor Mike, can I ride with you? By the time 3 o'clock came, I had five girls in my, in my truck wanting to go to the game. And so we get to about, uh, you know where the Tana Hills State Park exit is? Yeah. On 20 going toward Tuscaloosa. It just dawned on me that it costs if you're not playing. <laughs> so I said... Any of y'all got money to get in the game? And one by one said, it costs to get in the game. <laughs> so about four o'clock when we got there, uh, uh, Deacon Rick, uh, I was out $25 to get them girls in the game. <laughs> so after the game was over with, I asked them on the way, I said, y'all want to eat before the game or y'all want to eat after the game? They said, well, we want to eat after the game. And so it dawned on me when we got in the truck in the parking lot from the game, y'all got any money to eat? We were supposed to bring money to eat. About five of them, and they didn't order the, the, most, the cheapest thing on, on the menu. You know, you can't get out of Chick-fil-A without spending $10. So $60 later, I had spent $85 on these girls. But you can't beat God given no matter. So I came to prayer breakfast yesterday morning. And there was somebody at prayer breakfast that handed me an envelope and with a card in it. And I can't remember exactly what it said, but it said something like, Pastor Mike, we appreciate you. And we just want you to know that you keep doing what you're doing. And it had two $50 bills in it. You know why? Because you can't beat. God given, no matter what. That just, it has happened to me over and over and over and over again. Yeah. 
You don't know when, when, when I've lost loved ones and, and, and I've had to fly to California and, and the body of Christ has, has said, here, this is some money for your trip. You get all of your family there. You don't know what it felt like when I had my open heart surgery and I got cards and there, there, there was a little change in each one of the cards. You don't know what it feels like when, 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 when tuition needs to get paid and, 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 and folk didn't sign up for, for, the, for, the, for the dormitories. They got to live off campus and we ain't got no money for off campus. And, 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 and folks just out the blue, you get a little something, something. Because you can't beat God given. No matter what. And so what Paul is saying to these Philippians, I know you got drama. I know your situation is tough. I know these, these ladies in the church fighting and making it difficult. But rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I know that you're praising God, but once you figure out what it is, that's the real issue. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I know that it's racking your brain what's going on. Maybe, maybe you've always, you've thought, well, well, I know it happened in other folk church, but not in our church. And then you, 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 you cover your mind by thinking about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is just. Whatever is lovely, think and meditate on that, not on that. Amen. And if you can give to it, just to encourage, just to say, I'm with you. Slip a little something to that one lady. Slip a little something to that other lady. Melt their heart a little bit because they know they're wrong, but God's still giving to them. Yeah. God's grace is sufficient. Because in Philippians 1, he wants us to share the gospel. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In Philippians chapter 2, he wants me to be a servant like Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3, he wants me to sacrifice myself because I consider everything as loss for the sake of Christ. In Philippians chapter 4, he wants me to support the saints through my praise. Support the saints through my prayer. Support the saints through my perspective and to support the saints through my pennies. Men and women, that is how we keep our gospel mind, focused on what God wants us to do, focus on who he has made us in Christ, focus on his redemptive work, focus on him being a servant. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those on, under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. won't you say amen. 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 Father God, I thank you so much. For this word, Father, I thank you that how the word is like a double-edged sword. It's cutting both ways this morning. Lord, help me. Help me to keep my gospel mind. Lord, help me to praise you without ceasing. Help me to be a prayer warrior. Help me to maintain my perspective. Lord, help me to give where I can give. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that we would continue to follow hard after you, that we would continue to love you and rely upon Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Lord, all of life can be summarized in Jesus' life, Jesus' death, Jesus' burial and Jesus' resurrection. He is Lord today. Father, let us live with him being Lord of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Won't you stand? 
God bless y'all. God bless you.